And now, stand-up community subscribers and listeners from around the globe, it's time to Stand Up with Pete Dominic, where we ask the important questions that impact you, your family, and your community. Such as, will the State of the Union address finally put an end to all of those Pelosi is an alien robot rumors? <laughs> and did my forgetful neighbor remember to check his backyard animal trap, or am I in for another evening of shrieking raccoon death rattles? <laughs> And now, the podcast host who would never allow wayward mammals to go strolling la di da through his backyard, Pete Dominic! That's right, you've got me again. My double perimeter will not allow for such occurrences, my friend. And this year, we're going to have quite the surveillance system set up, motion cameras. I'll catch every critter and creature that comes through that garden because I mean business. Folks, thank you very much for joining me here on today's episode of the podcast. I've got two excellent guests joining me. Dr. Michael Mann joins me to talk about the latest climate report from the UN, the IPCC, as well as uh, quite a few more issues, including his testimony in front of Congress a couple weeks ago. And then for the first time, you are going to love Professor Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries of Ohio State University. We talk about the hysteria around CRT and so much more about what we need to teach our schools and how we need to organize to make sure it can get taught. So two excellent guests joining me and I've got you and welcome. Just want to thank you for all the support. A lot of new listeners on the show broke records, like doubled my most listened to show. I think it was on Monday. I don't know why. Whether it was my appearance on the Karen Hunter show or the fact that I just interviewed Bill Browder or a combination of the two. But we're on fire over here at Stand Up and so is the planet. But I'll leave that to my conversation with Dr. Michael Mann. Anyway, can't do it without your support. Thank you very much for joining me. Last night was the State of the Union. I think I'm going to have some clips for you on that. Depends on how much I get done here. But I'm going to try to cover everything that's not State of the Union because, of course, that's going to be overanalyzed, both the pre- and post-game and more in the morning. I'll have guests tomorrow on it, but lots to talk about in the news with Ukraine and the Russian invasion. Let's get to some of that audio I've got for you here in the top part I call The Last 24. What have we got? Well, let's start with what might have been the most moving and dramatic audio or clip that I saw yesterday. This was the Ukrainian President Zelensky himself addressing the nation, addressing the U.N. in a very brave fashion. And you actually even hear in this clip the translator himself get a bit emotional as his own translation wavers. But this is the uh, about under one minute clip. Part of it I'll take share with you. We are fighting just for our land and for our freedom. Despite the fact that all large cities of our country are now blocked, nobody is going to enter and intervene with our freedom and country. And believe you me, every square of today, no matter what it's called, is going to be called as today, Freedom Square in every city of our country. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Well, how about that? President Zelensky getting rave reviews around the world. And now here he is later on speaking in an exclusive interview with CNN and Reuters from a bunker in Kiev. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky urging U.S. President Joe Biden to deliver a strong and, quote, useful message about the Russian invasion at his State of the Union speech. And since he was talking to English-speaking outlets, he decided to speak English. How about that? And actually, this clip is about just what it would take to have a ceasefire. Everybody has to stop, stop fighting, and to go to that point from where it, it was beginning. Yep. Yes, it began five, six, today, six, six days ago. Yes. I think th- there are principal things you can do it, and that is very important moment. If you'll do this, and if those side is ready, it means that they are ready for the peace. If they don't ready, it means that you're just, you know, just 
Mm. Oh. Wasting your time. Do you think you're wasting your time or do you think they're ready? We'll see. We'll see, says Zelensky. Man, is that guy got some some brass ones. A brave guy, a courageous guy, and uh, as is every Ukrainian having to be right now. Well, the first Ukrainian immigrant lawmaker in the U.S. Congress is a woman named Victoria Sparts. She's a uh, Sparts. She's a Republican from Indiana, and she actually has been a harsh critic of the way that Biden's handled this and not a very harsh critic of Donald Trump. Surprise, surprise, even though he made that blackmailing phone call to Zelensky when he was president to get dirt on Biden. Nonetheless, Biden remains above it all and invites her to accompany him with other lawmakers to the State of the Union last night. He invited her, so she escorted him into the the Capitol. But here she is earlier in the day talking about her feelings on all of this. Uh, Ukrainian-born Congresswoman Victoria Sparts. I didn't prepare a speech, so I'll talk from my heart. This is not a war. This is a genocide of the Ukrainian people by a crazy man who cannot get over that Ukrainian people do not want socialism, Soviet Union, communists. They want to be with the United States of America. Well, there you go. A very emotional congresswoman. And she accompanied escort President Biden to the State of the Union last night. That's Victoria Sparks. I wish she would be more critical of Donald Trump. Okay, well, moving on, let's get to the Speaker of the House. This is Nancy Pelosi on TV yesterday, where she was asked, uh, I think it was MSNBC, to speculate about the sanity, the current mental wellness of Vladimir Putin. And she speculated wildly and pointed it to pretty much any possibility at all, probably on purpose, just to ridicule the guy and uh, and poke the bear, if you will, because she's probably got some kind of uh, high level intelligence analysis of him. But nobody knows. And a lot of the experts I watch say he hasn't really changed that much. So anyway, it doesn't stop her from speculating. Here she is. I don't know what is the matter there. I've talked to heads of state who have met with him and uh, they just take at face value the evil that he is putting forth as something that we have to deal with. They're not making a diagnosis of his health. Some people say he has cancer and some people say he has brain fog from um, uh, COVID. Uh, Other people just think he's a complete raging bully. But whatever it is, the people of Ukraine are paying the price for it. All right, Nancy Pelosi yesterday. Now, Democrats are pushing back on Republican efforts to blame Russia's invasion of Ukraine on President Biden. You've heard this narrative, right, where they they backed former President Donald Trump's assertion that the the president, that Putin, his decision to launch a full scale invasion of Ukraine last week would never have happened if he were still in office. Well, hard to prove a negative, but here it is. Congressman Jim McGovern blasting minority leader Kevin McCarthy and others uh, pinning blame for the invasion on Biden's policies during a House hearing on a bill to expand, he- expand health care for benefits for, for veterans. This is what he had to say. And when their standard bearer, Donald Trump, was in charge He spread propaganda about Ukrainian interference in the 2016 election, which was a lie. He ousted a well-regarded U.S. ambassador to Ukraine because they weren't doing what he wanted to in terms of finding dirt on his political opponents. Pro's military assistance to Ukraine. They said nothing. Withheld a White House meeting with Zelensky. Turn Ukraine policy over to Giuliani. I could go on and on and on. So we're not going to be lectured by them. And meantime, Kevin McCarthy was still having to answer questions from reporters on Marjorie Taylor Greene attending a white nationalist conference over the weekend. Here is a little back and forth from reporters and Republican leader Kevin McCarthy yesterday. Um, Can you please respond to Marjorie Taylor Greene attending the white nationalist uh, conference over the weekend? You know what? Um, I commented on that on yesterday. I, I, I understand your job. I understand what you're trying to do. I've already commented on that. We've got a war in Europe that we have not had since World War II. Yeah. We've got, we've got people in a village and others. And you can take my statement that I said yesterday and play it one more time. Yes. 
Okay, um, well, yeah, no, it's her. just that you mentioned World War II, and it's that she, Marjorie Taylor Greene, a Republican in, in your party, in your caucus, who you're uh, oversee, she was hanging out with Nazis. So that's why it's super relevant that one of your party members was at a Nazi rally and that, yeah, we're on the cusp of a major war in Europe, something we haven't seen since World War II, which is against Nazis, who she was hanging out with and seems to be one of, as a matter of fact, seems like there's a lot of Nazis and fascists in your party. Do you want to you address that, seeing as that you mentioned World War II? That's what I would have said if I were there to follow up, but I wasn't there. I was here in the shed. I think this is a cool thing. This is the uh, CEO of Airbnb. It's just cool. His name is Joe Gebbia. He announced the plan to provide free short-term housing to up to 100,000 refugees fleeing Ukraine. And if you want, you can give your house up, I guess, too, for a while to a Ukrainian family. Here he is, the uh, co-founder of Airbnb, Joe Gebbia. Yesterday, my co-founders and I sent letters to leaders across Europe, starting with the leaders of, of Poland, Germany, Hungary, and Romania. Uh, to offer our support to welcome refugees within their borders by providing providing short-term housing. And so we are announcing that Airbnb.org will offer free short-term housing to up to 100,000 refugees fleeing through Ukraine. And these stays will be funded by Airbnb. They'll be funded by donors to the Airbnb.org Refugee Fund and, of course, by the generosity of our hosts through Airbnb.org. And how about this clip went pretty viral yesterday. This is the former national security advisor, Warhawk man with who's just crazy and nuts and terrible, John Bolton. But he was on the right wing Newsmax show where he pushed back on, on the host there about uh, Trump and what he knew about Ukraine and what he did. And I thought this was pretty interesting to watch. Again, John Bolton, who worked for Donald Trump. There is something to be said, though, about the simple fact that there was not aggression during the four years. I mean, you were part of that administration as well. And there was not aggression from Russia. And they they waited him out, uh, it seems, and made a move. I mean, we we have a list of things that uh, the, the Brookings Institution says the Trump administration implemented 52 policy actions against Russia. Was pretty tough on Russia in a lot of ways, forcing NATO members to pay up, as we know, sanctioning Nord Stream 2. Um, oligarchs close to Putin were sanctioned, selling anti-tank weapons to Ukraine, so arming Ukraine, um, withdrawing from the INF Treaty and expelling Russian officers from this country as well. Uh, he looked at, in 2018, he looked NATO members in the eye uh, and, and talked about the reliance on Russian energy by Europe and how horrible that was. I mean, he took a very tough stance against Russia. I'm surprised you don't think that he would have handled no, this better didn't. than Joe Biden. No, he, he, he did not. He did not. We didn't sanction Nord Stream 2. We did. We didn't sanction Nord Stream 2. We should have. We should have brought the project to an end. Uh, We did impose sanctions on Russian oligarchs and and several others because of their sales of S-400 anti-aircraft systems to other countries. But in almost every case, the sanctions were imposed with Trump uh, uh, complaining about it and saying we were being too hard. Uh, The fact is that uh, he barely knew where Ukraine was. He once asked John Kelly, his second chief of staff, if Finland were a part of Russia. Uh, it's just not accurate to say that Trump's behavior somehow uh, deterred the Russians. I, I think the evidence but then, is then, but that Russia did? didn't feel. Let me finish now. Yeah, okay. Didn't feel didn't feel that their military was ready. Wow, John Bolton pushing back on the uh, the Newsmax right wing Trump guy. I thought that was pretty interesting as well. But now let's go to last night's State of the Union. First, I thought it was interesting that the Speaker of the House and the Vice President were the second and third most powerful people in the world, and they are women. And so that was a uh, pretty cool framing to see that shot last night. And here is Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, announcing the president as he and as he begins his speech. Members of Congress, I have the high privilege and distinct honor of presenting to you the president of the United States. I thought this Dave Rothkoff tweet thread was pretty, pretty passionate and uh, quite a rant because he kind of sets it up that every Republican in the Capitol, he tweeted, 
who voted to let Trump off the hook for trying to extort Ukraine by withholding vital military aid, who defended him when he argued we should draw down troops in NATO, who tried to dismiss his service to Putin, who took Russian money laundered through the NRA, who tried to paper over the Russian effort to meddle in our elections, who did not condemn Trump when he chose to support Putin over our intelligence community, who refused to condemn Trump. For calling Putin a genius who meekly accepted Fox News and Trump allies offering Putin talking points on the eve of the commission of a wave of war crimes who helped advance Putin's agenda of weakening the U.S. by defending Trump's efforts to attack our democracy. Every single Republican, every one of them has blood on their hands today. Every single one has sided with our enemies against the interests and values of the United States. Every single one of them has declared themselves through their actions to be anti-American and anti-democracy. And then he finishes by saying, do not let their posturing or their Ukrainian flag pocket squares or their self-righteous and insupportable efforts to attack Biden administration distract from this. A few times in our history have so many senior political leaders so betrayed our country so often for so long. And with that context of who was there, here is the president last night. Uh, just some comments about Putin and the invasion into Ukraine. Together, along with our allies, we are right now enforcing powerful economic sanctions. We're cutting off Russia's largest banks in the international financial system, preventing Russia's central bank from defending the Russian ruble, ruble, making Putin's $630 billion war fund worthless. We're choking Russia's access. We're choking Russia's access to technology that will sap its economic strength and weaken its military for years to come. Tonight, I say to the Russian oligarchs and the corrupt leaders who built billions of dollars off this violent regime, no more. The United States, I mean it. The United States, the Department of Justice is assembling a dedicated task force to go after the crimes of the Russian oligarchs. We're joining with European allies to find and seize their yachts, their luxury apartments, their private jets. We're coming for you, ill-begotten gains. And tonight, I'm announcing that we will join our allies in closing off American airspace to all Russian flights, further isolating Russia and adding additional squeeze on their economy. Yeah, there you go. And that was one of the big announcements unveiled last night. It's uh, getting harder and harder to be Russian in Russia right now and, and, and do anything. And I actually particularly like this moment last night, especially for America's children. I, I don't know. You know, Grandpa Joe can be really comforting and show a lot of empathy. And I thought this was an authentic moment where he was trying to bring aid and comfort to those Americans who are concerned about what's happening right now and how it might affect them. But I want you to know we're going to be OK. We're going to be OK. When the history of this era is written, Putin's war in Ukraine will have left Russia weaker and the rest of the world stronger. Well, all right, that's just a sampling of the top of the speech. I had to get back into the edit so I couldn't get to all the domestic policy stuff that he had to talk about as well as pushing to get the, uh, the, the bill back better bill passed, talking about covid and so much more. But I will talk with Aaron David Miller about it tomorrow and maybe somebody else, as well as Christine Romans. I'm scheduled to talk to, I think I mentioned as well. And I hope to hear from you and talk to you at the Thursday night stand up happy hour hangout about the State of the Union. But right now, I'm going to get to all of the rest of the headlines that aren't necessarily related to State of the Union or Ukraine. I mean, I might sneak a couple in there, but let's do it. Oh, wait, before I play the jingle, the news dump jingle for you today from Pete Co., I want to read uh, some of his fan mail that came from Kayleen earlier today. Longtime listener Kayleen wrote, Pete, Ch- uh, Pete Co.'s jingles are so funny, especially yesterday's. As I was walking yesterday listening to your podcast, his jingles made me laugh out loud. Super good as of late. As you know, I've stopped using Twitter, so please tell Pete Co. I am enjoying his jingles. And Kayleen, I uh, I passed that along to Pete, and he really appreciated it. I know he always appreciates everybody's kind words. So let's get to it with tonight's News Dump Jingle, another original from Pete Coe. Uh-oh, Hank the Tank is back. Hank the Tank, nuisance bear, warden's in a huff. The residents have grown to like him for today's News Dump. <laughs> 
Oh, wow. The plot is thickening with Hank the Tank. But how about this one, Pico? I just saw this and, and I immediately texted it to Pico. How about this story? Hounds, these dogs chased a mountain lion into a tree and the governor of Montana, Greg Gianforte, he shot it. He, The governor of Montana is the guy who body slammed that reporter. Remember that guy? He somehow became then governor. He was a congressman, then he became governor, and then he shot a mountain lion uh, on a mountain lion hunt, which was on public land, and there's some controversy around it, I guess. So there you go, Pete Co. That jingle wrote itself for you. And now to other news. Speaking of uh, Russia, Ukraine, the invasion, uh, another development. Apple has halted product sales in Russia. How about that? They're halting all sales of all products in Russia amid the country's invasion of Ukraine. That would definitely cause a revolution here in the U.S. If the Apple store, you couldn't get your Apple stuff, couldn't get your maintenance. I mean, how are people going to deal with that amongst other things? Well, Major League Baseball and their the union representing the players, Major League Base, uh, Baseball Players Association, failed to reach a deal on a new collective bargaining agreement resulting in the cancellation of the league's opening day in some regular season games. In news conference Tuesday, the commissioner told reporters the players' union rejected the final offer that owners presented them. So now we'll have to see what happens with the baseball, Major League Baseball season. That's going to be depressing for a lot of folks who, who really look forward to that. May I give you a tip to start gardening? Get your seeds started right now, folks. I'm going to be doing that at the end of this week. Really looking forward to it. I mean, maybe you can replace your love of baseball with gardening. The U.S. government now banning Russian planes and airlines. I mentioned that. Uh, well, you heard that, I think, in the State of the Union speech, but I, I kept that news story in there. Also, ExxonMobil on Tuesday announcing it would discontinue operations of a key oil and gas project in Russia, as well as halt any further investments in the country in response to to their invasion in Ukraine. I mean, the hits keep coming. Now, they had primary elections in Texas yesterday. Former Representative Beto O'Rourke easily captured the Democratic nomination for Texas governor on Tuesday, setting up for his first statewide general election since his 2018 loss to old Ted Cruz. He's going to be facing Texas Governor Greg Abbott, who is uh, facing a crowded field of Republican primary challenges, but challengers himself, but widely expected to lock down the nomination. So O'Rourke and Abbott are going to be going uh, up for the governorship. The governor's mansion in Texas should be very interesting race to watch. You know how close that Senate race was. An auditor is now saying that the Iowa's, Iowa's state auditor is calling for the governor, Kim Reynolds, to return half a million dollars in federal coronavirus relief funds that were used to pay for 21 governor's office officers, uh, staff members in 2020. So that's an interesting controversy playing out in Iowa. That governor can't seem to uh, stay away from scandal. I thought this is an interesting story or statistic to mention. As President Biden noted in the State of the Union, the U.S. economy grew 5.7 percent last year. That's the fastest pace since 1984. Put another way, economic growth last year was the strongest since Ronald Reagan was in office. I'm looking forward to talk with Christine Romans about that. Rebounding quickly from the pandemic recession, growth, of course, has been uneven with each new wave of infections acting as a kind of speed bump on the road to recovery, according to NPR's Scott Horsley. Tens of thousands are evacuating Australia's worst floods in over a decade, and I've been seeing it firsthand because my best friend lives down there, and I haven't even mentioned it, but a torrential rains and record flooding inundating the eastern states of Queensland and New South Wales, killing at least eight people, forcing tens of thousands to evacuate Residents could be seen taking refuge on rooftops as the fast rising water submerged their homes. Terrible, terrible rains in Australia. And thanks to my brother for sending me this story because he says it's a very undercovered, a horrific and tragic story unfolding in Afghanistan where the Agence Frepreuse AFP is reporting that Afghan civilians are now selling their vital organs on the black market to feed their families. The starvation in Afghanistan is a huge, horrible situation. More than half of the country's 38 million 
people are suffering from acute hunger, nearly 9 million Afghans at risk of famine, according to the United Nations. President Biden, of course, choosing to withhold about $7 billion in Afghan assets, repurposing half the money as compensation to the victims of the 9-11 attacks, apparently. Furthermore, foreign aid that once propped up the country has been slow to return the wake in the wake of new U.S. sanctions. And who knows what how that money would be processed through the Taliban. But this is a preventable issue, a slow motion humanitarian catastrophe that my brother says uh, is uh, Washington, the federal government, the Biden administration is responsible for. Democratic hawks and, of course, all the Republicans seem united in what he says is a highly punitive and barbaric policy. Read about it at Algeria, Al Jazeera, agency of free press, AFP, Afghan civilians selling their vital organs to feed their families. And that is the kind of story that is undercover. Thanks, bro, for sending that along. All right. So how about some rapid fire good headlines? We can now use new CRISPR gene editing on ticks to fight Lyme disease in humans. I think that's good. The Mexican tequila fish is successfully reintroduced where it was once extinct. And that's pretty great. A new survey is saying that the values of giving, compassion and family are flourishing across the world. I wonder why that could be. And now 75% of people worldwide want single-use plastics banned, according to a new global survey. So some good news headlines right here at the end of today's news dump. Brought to you by listeners like you. If you aren't a paid subscriber, please consider becoming one right now. Also, write a review on Apple iTunes as well as and or Spotify. Subscribe to YouTube.com slash Stand Up With Pete and go to StandUpWithPete.com to sign up right now for a paid subscription. Join us in our weekly hangouts and anytime on the Discord platform, only available to subscribers. Hope to see you at tomorrow night's hangout, everybody. All right, well, coming up for the first time ever on the show, you are going to absolutely love my conversation with Professor Hassan Kwame Jeffries of... Ohio State University, we had a great conversation about what is happening in our schools with teaching race and racism and the CRT hysteria and what CRT isn't and what needs to get done. Really an amazing new guest and a great conversation with Professor Jeffries, who is, by the way, Hakeem, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries' brother. I didn't even know that until just before I actually met him and found out in my prep. You're going to love that. Please listen to that conversation. But first, I've got one of the most respected climate scientists in the country. He is the author of more than 200 peer-reviewed and edited publications, numerous op-eds and commentaries. He's testified in front of Congress many times, including recently. We start by talking about that. He's the author of five books, and he is a, most importantly, distinguished professor of atmospheric science and director of the Earth System Science Center at Penn State University. I'm always so glad when we get to talk. He is the the climate scientist to the stars like Leonardo DiCaprio and many more, and he's been such an outspoken leader in his field for so long, and I'm so proud to call him my friend. He's on Twitter at Michael E. Mann. I'd love to see you tweeting him and thanking him for joining me on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Michael Mann and I talking about the latest IPCC report, his testimony in front of Congress, and what the Russian invasion of Ukraine Ukraine means for the energy wars. Michael Mann, me, ow. There's my friend, Dr. Michael Mann. Thank you, as always, for joining me. Great to see you. Great to talk to you. How are you? How's it going? You got beat, You got really beaten up at that uh, at your testimony, the oversight committee, by that mean Republican guy. <laughs> There, there were a few exchanges that uh, I, I thought, you know, if anything, reflected poorly as if we needed more, you know, evidence that that the Republicans are not engaged in good faith on really any of the major issues we face today, it, but it, certainly the climate crisis. And, and it is gr- always great to be with you, my friend. If I uh, if I play a minute of that, was it Clay Higgins as name, Congressman? If I played Clay that minute Higgins. back and forth, would it be a waste of everybody's time or can I do it? And then you can respond. Yeah, no, let, let's do it. Right. Um, as grating as it will be on my ears once again. Yeah, I'm sorry. I trigger alert everybody. When I first saw this a few weeks ago, this was from the uh, the House Oversight uh, Committee hearing on, I forget what it was called, but it was obviously on climate, the climate crisis. 
and this is Republican Clay Higgins. And when I saw this, I got so mad. I wrote and rewrote tweets. But so everybody prepare yourself for this. Here we go. So I'm going to ask our panelists, everyone, yes or no, to have an opportunity to participate in something called truth. Yes or no, Dr. Mann. Sorry, you believe that question? America's energy uh, industry should be nationalized. Uh, I'm, that that's not a, a matter for me to decide. That's a matter. For I'll take that Congress as a yes. To decide. No, uh, Mr. No, Mark that's Mandel. not a yes. That's not a yes. It's a, it's an irrelevant uh, comment. See, it's a relevant question for me. You you see, Mr. Mann, you're referred to as a distinguished. I would say that if it were up to you, because you're quite an arrogant fellow, in my opinion. You'd add revered and heralded to your title. You know you support the nationalization of American oil. All right, so there it is. Now we're back live with Dr. Michael Mann. I will say to his to his argument, you have off air always said, please refer to me as your highness to me. But I thought that was our thing. And he does he does get you there with the arrogance. Yeah, no, it, it's true. And, you know, and he's he's such a modest fellow himself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I, it was it was almost like, you know, I felt like it was a skit on Colbert or something of that sort. It just uh, it was surreal. The guy's almost a caricature of a climate change denier, fossil fuel industry funded climate change denier. You know, your listeners might not be surprised to to learn that he has associated with white supremacists. Mm. It's sort of the whole picture. It's what's wrong with our politics today. The fact that we have people like that representing the good people of Louisiana who deserve better than that. So it also kind of uh, helps us understand where where certain certainly elements of and people of the Republican Party are on this issue way, way behind still line. For the fossil well, fuel. Let, let me mention one more thing, Pete, uh, you know, w- and I pointed this out actually in a later exchange uh, because it had rubbed me the wrong way that then Dara exchange and the fact that he was leaving it out there, this idea that that we want to nationalize the energy industry. And I pointed out that, no, most of us are talking about using market mechanisms that were originally put in place by people like, Ro- you know, Ronald Reagan and George Bush to to to, you know, uh, deal with the externalities of uh, of pollution through uh, pricing mechanisms, through um, cap and trade. These are market mechanisms for dealing with an environmental crisis that were supported. In fact, were put forward by Republicans like Ronald Reagan. And here now we have Clay Higgins essentially on the opposite side of this issue from Ronald Reagan. So. We can talk about the economic solutions if we want, but uh, we let's you know, you're a scientist. That's certainly what you were trying to say there. But he he wasn't having it. So let me ask you, though, a separate question about a super relevant issue, which is what's happening in Ukraine. I call it Putin's war. The invasion of Ukraine is how I'm referring to it, Michael. And you why am I asking a climate scientist about this? Well, because you have something to say about the energy reserves of different countries and how they affect uh, our economies, our lives, and certainly how they are often the catalysts for war. We can talk about the Middle East forever and the Middle East wars that we've been involved with for 30 years. uh, And we can talk about right now what's going on in Russia. It's all connected. What do you what are your thoughts? And I know you have many about the energy wars and what role they play in this current conflict. Yeah, you know, I mean, we here we are, you know, uh, in another war, um, uh, a, a war of a, aggression on the part of Russia towards Ukraine, where Russia has been able to hold, uh, at least to, to some extent, was able to hold other Western powers hostage because of their oil and gas supply um, that they provide to the rest of the world and Germany, other European countries who depend on their natural gas. The reality is that. Russia can engage in punitive actions against other countries by withholding access to their fossil fuel reserves because we're dependent on fossil fuels. And we fight dangerous foreign wars in places like the Middle East over access to fossil fuels and trillions of dollars uh, that are spent on defense, that are spent on national security. And a threat to the planet with somebody like Vladimir Putin, who is now threatened to potentially use the nuclear arms that he has 
in the escalation of this um, conflict. How many times do we have to be reminded of all of these hidden and not so hidden costs of our continued dependence on fossil fuels? And I haven't even talked about the defining crisis of our time, the climate crisis yet. What else do we need to know to recognize that we have to get off fossil fuels as soon as possible? Do you know off the top of your head where kind of Russia's stance has been on these issues, on climate change, what the conversation is like there? Because obviously everybody refers to them as a a gas station with an army, that their major (laughs) source of their GDP is gas and oil, oil and gas. And however, I do think didn't they sign the Paris Climate Accords and we pulled out of them and and they stayed in them in terms of making commitments to bring down their obviously huge carbon footprint? Yeah, you know, I mean, the United States, uh, Trump was the only country to pull out of the Paris. It's so, you know, that tells you something when even a tyrant like uh, Vladimir Putin was better than, than Donald Trump on this issue. But that's not saying much because. As you say, Russia's primary asset today is their fossil fuels. That is the source of their economy um, is natural resources and in particular fossil fuels, gas, oil. They have actually done everything they can to quash environmental climate action uh, by using trolls and bots on social media to try to divide the public in Canada. They tried to prevent passage of climate legislation in Canada. They've done the same thing in the United States and Australia. They, you know, have, you know, they they did technically sign on to the Paris uh, Agreement, which was more than we can say for Donald Trump. Right. But at the same time, they have done everything to undermine it. They were one of only a handful of countries Russia, Saudi Arabia, the United States under Trump and uh, one or two others who refused to sign on to uh, a statement by the U.N. that, you know, endorsing the conclusions of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And so Putin has been no friend to climate action. He's done everything he can to stymie it. And you know, again, um, we have these bad actors, these petro states like Saudi Arabia and Russia that are a threat to us globally in terms of our security and are a threat to, you know, the action that's necessary to avert a climate catastrophe. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, it's, and those are the two. You know, obviously, the, the climate issue getting a lot of attention this week because the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, a body of experts, what, like 100, 270 researchers, 67 countries. This is the sixth report this panel has put out. You've been involved with it, of course, throughout your career. Uh, and it was uh, put out on Monday. Yeah. And so we're seeing what's happening in with the invasion of Ukraine and, and people now talking and worrying about nuclear war. Have you seen like Armageddon and end times are trending? To be fair, Pat Robertson made a prediction and apparently that has a, <laughs> a big impact. But but the point is, we're now thinking about all of these things at once, specifically now the climate crisis again being in the news because of the report that came out Monday. So just tell me a little bit, of, if you can, a little background on the IPCC in terms of what goes into this report and and why it seems to be the standard bearer for the planet, the the current status. It's like a state of the planet. Uh, We're having the state of the union. It's the state of the planet report by everybody. Explain what goes into it, why it matters. Yeah. So, you know, it operates under the United Nations uh, framework convention on climate change ever since 1990, every five to six years or so the IPCC which consists of uh, thousands of scientists around the world who, over several years, do an assessment of the latest uh, evidence, the latest science when it comes to the climate crisis. Um, uh, They were charged with the mission of informing our assessment of dangerous human interference with the climate. And the IPCC has continued to do that every five years. And the, you know, the message is becoming louder uh, and and more shrill. We've gotten to the point where pretty mild-mannered scientists who uh, you know really are in some measure quite conservative in in how they frame things and what they're willing to to state and how blunt they're willing to be are literally now shouting from the rooftops that 
we are facing an existential crisis and we haven't yet seen the action necessary to avert it. We're making some progress. And that's the good news. Our carbon emissions have come to a plateau. That's the good news. They've stopped increasing. The bad news is they've got to come halfway down that plateau, halfway down that mountain within this decade. We need to bring carbon emissions down 50 percent by 2030 and down to zero by the middle of the century if we're going to keep warming below one and a half degrees Celsius, three degrees Fahrenheit, where as this report lays bare, we will see ever more depth. If you think we're seeing you know, climate consequences now with the heat waves and wildfires and floods and super storms and droughts that we're facing now. You haven't seen anything yet. If we warm the planet more than three degrees Fahrenheit, we will see far worse. So let's get to some of the takeaways. I mean, you've been basically talking about these issues for, well, the whole time, uh, you, your, your whole career. They just become more and more exacerbated. But how can a panel like this uh, frame it for non-scientists to understand how much thing, how much worse things have gotten and, and, and make predictions as to how much worse they will get? And obviously, I think the, the, the time length that matters. So what's new in this report that we can understand I think, you know, the IPCC essentially now saying that dangerous climate change is here. It's not at one and a half cells, three Fahrenheit or four Fahrenheit or five Fahrenheit. By some measure, it's here. If you're Puerto Rico, if you're California, if you're Louisiana or North Carolina, if you're Pennsylvania, where we saw epic flooding with Hurricane Ida, um, Philadelphia, uh, feet of water. Dangerous climate change has arrived. And yeah, the New, York, the New York Times puts it. Let me just uh, jump in here, Michael, because it, what, exactly what you're saying. They say the perils are already visible across the globe, yeah. according to the report. In 2019, storms, floods and other extreme weather events displaced more than 13 million people across Asia and Africa. To your point, it's here. Rising heat and drought are killing crops and trees, putting millions worldwide at increased risk of hunger and malnutrition, while mosquitoes carrying diseases like malaria and dengue are spreading into new areas. To your point, Dr. Mann, it is here. Finally, roughly half the world's population currently faces severe water scarcity at least part of the year. To your point again, it is here. So I just wanted yeah. to kind of back yeah. that up. But uh, and we can make it darker before you bring some light. I know you have some light to bring. There are some rainbows that you can see. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it does look pretty bleak, right? Because we can we can see the catastrophic consequences now playing out in, in real time. And, and that's the, what the report has said. And in part, it's because there are some tools that the scientific community has developed over the last decade or so to do what's known as attribution, where we can literally look at a particular event like that, you know, the, the devastating flooding we saw here in Pennsylvania with Hurricane Ida, the wildfires in California last summer, the heat dome that we saw in the Pacific Northwest. We can look at events like that and we can use climate models to assess how likely they would have been if we hadn't been warming up the planet with carbon pollution and how likely they are now that we have done that. And you can compare right. how often the events happen in this sort of counterfactual world where we didn't warm the climate and in the actual world where we have. And when you see, for example, an event that the counterfactual says shouldn't happen any more often than once in 30,000 years, and it happened, <laughs> what is telling us, this, these attribution exercises are saying, we can now essentially say that climate change caused that event. We're willing to say that. You used to hear scientists uh, couch, you know, these connections in, in, in caveats and in very tentative language. Well, we can never you know, blame anyone. We're not saying that anymore. What we're saying is, yeah, we wouldn't have seen anything that extreme. We wouldn't have seen, you know, Las Vegas like heat in Canada. We wouldn't have seen months worth of rainfall over 20 in a 24 hour period in, you know, we wouldn't have seen these events in the absence of human caused climate change. And so the tools are sort of there now for the scientific community to connect the dots. But here's the thing. The, the climate models um, are, you know, not capturing all of the mechanisms that we know are important in the real world. And some of my work has argued that we are we with these climate models that are used to draw these attribution conclusions the models are actually underestimating the impact that climate right. change is having on many of these extreme events. So if anything, 
you know, the models are overly conservative, but at least there are there's these tools now where we can draw those connections rigorously. And, and that's what you see in this report. Scientists saying, yeah, we can connect the dots for you now. And you ask, you know, what do scientists need to do? Well, you know, ideally we work then, you know, the scientists work with journalists, comedians, talk show, uh, you know, hosts and everybody else who can help get that message out like you're doing here today, my friend. Well, I always appreciate it when you help me understand these things. Before I let you go, though, uh, this is, a, you know, this is the sixth report. It's a big deal. Uh, you know, but again, I do worry about that. Things like this, this issue always gets undercovered. Some people, you know, st- have started to th- think that it gets it's it's getting better coverage uh, in many different ways. I think over the last couple of years, for sure, even given everything else. But. I wanted to give us an opportunity to discuss any other anything else about this report that you want to mention in terms of uh, what's new or what's old that needs to bears repeating, because I'm yeah. always I'm always happy uh, to hear the same message over and over to rem- be reminded about what's broken and what would work to fix it. Yeah, thanks. You know, so the urgency is clear. Uh, This message makes a very strong case for the urgency of, you know, immediate action that goes far beyond what we've seen yet. And, you know, it has implications, for example, for us, we've got to turn out large numbers in this midterm election Um, right right now. You know, 50 Democrats, two of whom seem to be caucusing with Republicans. um, That's not going to get this done. That's not going to get meaningful climate legislation, even with a Democratic president. So we need much larger Democratic majorities, frankly, that only one of the two parties now cares about, you know, democracy uh, or, you know, the climate crisis. And so we need to turn out. We need to make sure everybody we know turns out in this midterm election and votes for, you know, politicians who support democracy and support, you know, addressing the greatest crisis that we face. Um, That's what I would say to your listeners. Let's begin that work now. Let's organize and make sure that we turn out in droves in this midterm election so that we get the government that we deserve, not a government that is essentially a wholly owned subsidiary of the fossil fuel industry. And I would remind people to continue to work locally, too, because so often the solutions and adaptations for climate start in local communities from charging stations to bike lanes to, you know, anti-plastic campaigns. There's so much that you can do. On a local level, we talked with uh, Melissa Walker about the the states project yesterday about that. And they do include in their initiatives, you know, adaptation to the climate crisis and what you can do locally. So don't forget that. What is this? You've written. Yeah. A ch- you know, I would just make a very you know, we've got to prevent the climate change that is still preventable and provide the resources and the resilience to people to deal with the, the changes that are now baked in. We've got to do both of those things. It's not either or just want to mention before you leave you have uh, what co-authored authored a children's book, The Tantrum, that saved the world, and it comes out in uh, on March fifteenth. Uh, you can, I'm sure, pre-order it now. What is this? You have a children's book that you work you've worked on with Megan Herbert. Yeah, so she's wonderful. She's a children's uh, illustrator and author, and uh, we actually wrote this book a number of years ago. We uh, published the first edition in 2016, but uh, Megan self-published it and we had a limited distribution of only uh, i think a thousand copies or two thousand copies and so fortunately now uh, a major distributor penguin um random house has picked it up um and this book is going to be available as a major release on march 15th you can find it on amazon.com uh you can find it on uh, the penguin random house web uh site um and it's about you know amazingly enough when we wrote the book it's about a a young girl who I won't give the the story away, but she becomes frustrated by the animals that are showing up at her door who've been displaced by climate change, throws this tantrum, but it becomes an empowering tantrum. She becomes the change that she wishes to see in the world. And I like to say that this book presaged the youth climate movement, uh, Greta Thunberg and the youth climate movement, because it actually came out before uh, Greta emerged on the scene and sort of you know, it was life imitating art in a very profound way. And now we've got this updated version, the second edition of the book um, that is expanded and um, and really draws upon the fact that the youth climate movement now has very much become central uh, to our effort to address the climate crisis. What I'm hearing is you're trying to indoctrinate kids into your uh, 
anti fossil fuel uh, campaign I'm and sure a very Clay, uh, what's his name will will make that uh, Clay uh, Clay Higgins you sound, Clay sounds Higgins, like an arrogant yeah. sounds very arrogant to me your children's book <laughs> The arrogance. Oh, God. Didn't he wear like a vest and a monocle or something and carry a staff around like a some like kind of weird guy? Yeah, I should have. I should have done that. Oh, God. It was just so infuriating that, you you know, I wanted to just uh, uh, go nuts on it in your defense. But I didn't have to. You're a big boy. And that would have only <laughs> given him probably more attention. So thank yeah. you, as always, for joining me. Thank you for your testimony on at the Oversight Committee. That was really great. People should watch that. I, I watched it in preparation to talk to you. And it was some. Okay. Really interesting points being made to the silly arguments, especially and solutions and adaptations being offered. And thank you, as always, my friend, for joining me. Awesome. Thank you, my friend. It's always a pleasure. Look forward to talking again soon. All right. Well, scary and pressing stuff, but an important conversation. There is hope to keep alive with Dr. Michael Mann, Professor Michael Mann. Tweet him at Michael E. Mann. Go get all of his books and Watch his videos and, and his appearances and read his columns. I love that guy. I always get a real charge out of just the idea that I get to talk to him and that we become actual friends who who talk about all kinds of different stuff offline as well. Michael Mann, everybody, so cool. All right, well, now it's my great pleasure to introduce you to a guest who's joining me for the first time on the show. He is a professor at Ohio State University where he teaches African-American history, U.S. history since 1877, power culture in the state, race, ethnicity, and nation, and much, much more. Born in Brooklyn, went to Morehouse and got his Ph.D. and is now at Duke and is now, of course, at Ohio State. As I said, author of Buddy Laundas, Civil Rights and Black Power in Alabama's Black Belt. Also the editor of Understanding and Teaching the Civil Rights Movement, as you'll learn He is the brother of Hakeem Jeffries, congressman from New York's 8th District, and just a brilliant guy. I'm so happy that I got him on the show and got to have this conversation with him. Looking forward to talking to him a lot more because this is a guy who actually regularly consults school districts on developing anti-racism program. He gets in the classroom and actually works with students and opening their minds and new ways of understanding the past and the present. And he does that same thing right here in this conversation. Really psyched to have him on for the first time. Please say hi to him on Twitter at Prof Jeffries, J-E-F-F-R-I-E-S. Look at the show notes for more about him. Watch his TED Talk. Here we go. Oh, right. There he is. Dr. Professor Sir Hassan Kwame Jeffries. What a great honor to have you on the podcast for the first time. I'm really excited to talk to you. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be with you, Pete. You're uh, at The Ohio State University where you wear a tie and suspenders, apparently. That is true. And and the Ohio State, I didn't make it up. That's what's on the check. So that's what I roll with, my friend. And it would seem, and I don't know you well, but it would seem based on today's outfit and some of the videos that I've seen, you may be actually matching the necktie to suspenders. How many suspenders do you have, sir? It is enough for me to go a full semester wearing a different pair. No. It, it is, man. It is. Look, so my 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 brother, before he launched into his political career, right, it was close, we're two, two, two years apart. I was a poor graduate student. He was a he was a lawyer, right? Working for a nice white shoe firm and he was building up a war chest. Uh, and so he had these nice suits. I couldn't afford the suits. And so I was I was I was so young walking to these classrooms. I was like, okay, how can I dress up with what I have? And so I just stumbled upon the suspenders. And now I just I just roll with that's, that's a quarter century of suspenders, man. Just what <laughs> just one follow-up, which is Storage would seem like a very, like, how do you store, where do you put all these suspenders? You have a suspender drawer, <laughs> closet, you have a mannequin? Uh, not, not a full closet, but you, a, a makeshift tie rack, man. You just put them on, easy to go, grab and go. Got the ties above, the suspenders below. Matt, pair them up, and I'm all good right. to go, man. <laughs> I thought that was going to be the final one. I know you're a married man. Please tell me your wife's joke or reference to your suspenders. There's got to be something. <laughs> No, she's cool with it, right? She's just like, hey, this is this is who you are. This is how you roll with. Oh wow! My, uh, I, uh, my I like her. Like I like her. Out, though. <laughs> All right. So you mentioned your brother, and I was mm-hmm. I was you know I found your work I think in the most organic possible way, uh, and your podcast that you've been hosting, and and your TED talk, and your books, and then I'm like, who does this guy look like? Who does he sound like? I go, he sounds just like Congressman Hakeem. 
Jeffries. And then I was like, what the, what? oh my <laughs> gosh. So your brother is like one of the most influential, highest ranking Democrats in the House of Representatives. He, he represents New York's uh, eighth district in, in New York City, where both of you grew up. My question, sir, is who are your parents? <laughs> My parents are just some social workers, right? I mean, they are parents. We love them dearly, but they grew up as social workers. My dad, uh, my mother worked for the state of New York, uh, for, 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 for the city of New York, and my dad worked for the state. My dad was a drug counselor uh, for 20, 30 years in the 70s, 80s, uh, and 90s in New York, man. So they raised us to be public servants, uh, to serve the people uh, in one way or another. They said, don't matter what you do, as long as you do it in service to people. Oh, that's really interesting. Did you ever rebel against that? Like, I, I, I want to go into the private sector. And I mean, your brother, you know, worked in a corporate law firm. Maybe that was his pathway to get into the, the house uh, to be able to afford to, to run a campaign. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. like, did you ever think of doing other any, anything other than academics? I mean, you know, early on, it was I was in a, a high school, a medical science magnet program. And I thought about medical research, you know, but they, they didn't really say, like, you have to do this. or You have to do that. They said, no matter what you do do it in service to people. And so they sort of left it open to us. And they said, whatever angle that you choose, that's the angle that we'll support. I love that. It's really, it's really interesting. And and obviously you guys, I mean, is there any competition or, or between the two of you in terms of him being this uh, super influential congressman and, and you being a very respected uh, academic professor at Ohio State University, author, Ted Talker? You know, the, the friendly competition that you would have between siblings, it, it usually it, it's not about sort of uh, professional attainment and more about, you know, who can still take each other on the court when we go one on one. The games have slowed down considerably uh, and he usually bests me because he got an inch or two. But, you know, he also put on some weight over the last couple of years, which he now slimmed down. So I've even lost my weight advantage. Uh, but it's usually, it's usually around the things that brothers usually razz each other about. That's uh, that's awesome. You guys still have a good relationship. You talk a lot. You know, <laughs> you know, he's the congressman, so it's hard to get in touch with him. You know, sometimes, you know, I mean, we do talk and we text and stuff like that. But half the time, you know, it's like somebody will say, oh, your brother's on TV. And like, oh, OK, let me see what he's up to. Like he was just he was just in England. I was like, oh, really? I didn't know. I thought that's he was hilarious. back in Brooklyn. So. It's hard to keep up with him, but he's but we but we still love each other and we still talk when we can. I, I love it. That's a really interesting relationship, and the fact that both of you have ended up where you you've ended up. You both have your own families now. I just want to ask you one more kind of background, personal thing. Uh, my friend Bakari Sellers is a like you, uh, a, an alumni of uh, Morehouse College, and and reading his book, I think I probably learned more about that school than anything. And before, I never really knew that much about Morehouse, much less historically black universities and colleges. I thought since you're, uh, a, is it a Morehouse man? I don't know. How, what, Morehouse what man. Yeah. What, what did, what did that, exp why did you go there? What experience, you know, what was your experience there? How did that affect you? You know, it was, it was an amazing experience. One of the best decisions that I made, or at least one of the best decisions that I thought I made, uh, you know, my brother, he stayed in state. And so he stayed in New York and he went up to uh, Binghamton state university of New York. Sure. And my parents, who were both black college graduates, they went to Central State in Ohio. Uh, they were like, look, we want one of y'all to head south. We want one of y'all to head south. We grew up in the Northeast and, in the, in the, you know, in, in the mid-Atlantic, if you will. But they said the South has such deep roots and connections and ties, not only to our family, but also to the African-American experience. And if you go south, one of y'all, we would love to go to Morehouse College just because of the reputation, the number of ministers and clergy and leaders who have come through there. And I pushed back against that, Pete. I was like, look, I don't know nothing about the South. Right? I'm a Brooklyn boy, you know, like, I'm staying up here. But then I went down there and I visited. I said, wow, this is an amazing place. And the history of it, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, the people who walked uh, those, the, those that, that brick yard, if you will, uh, was just amazing. Everybody from Spike Lee to Martin Luther King to Edwin Moses. I mean, you just across the board. And I was like, if I can have, if I can come out of there, get a little bit of what they got, then I'll be doing something good. And what did you get? Like, what was what? What is that experience specifically like? It's not like a normal college experience, is my understanding. It's it seems like it's more like some kind of uh, experience of some some you know, institution with a story history. If you went here, yeah. this this happened. You learn this, and <laughs> it's a lot more than just you know they wearing. Call a it, they call it the Morehouse Mystique. The Morehouse Mystique. Yeah, they, tell they, me, they, get, the get, Morehouse Mystique. They, get, they try to bottle it, but you can't bottle it because it's it's. You're bringing, just imagine this, right? I mean, you have 
you're bringing African-American young men, right, from across the country, right, and even internationally, from the Caribbean, South America, Africa, and from you're bringing them together in one place. And you're learning as much. So in one way, it's not any different than any other college or university. You're learning in the classroom, but you're also learning as much about America, about life, about the Black experience from the brothers just sitting next to in the classroom and in the dorm room, right? And on the play, on, 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 in, in the gym. And it's just an amazing, phenomenal experience. And you're learning about yourself. Who, I, who am I? In, this, in, in, in a way, you're not in a bubble, right? But you're in an environment in which you can focus solely on this work. You don't have to worry about all the racism and all the silliness. And is this professor judging me for yeah. this, that, and the other? You can just get down to the work. And then there's a mission, right? It's like, okay, just as my parents were like, you got to do this work in service to the people. Morehouse is like, you got to do this work in service for African-Americans, for the broader project of bringing about civil rights and human rights, not only for African-Americans, but really for everybody. You have a commitment and we're going to help you fulfill that commitment as you come through here. Wow. It's, I, I could talk to you about any one of these things for forever. I've really enjoyed learning about your work and preparing to talk to you today. And I want to talk about that now. Uh, we're in the fight of our lives. And I mean, we, I mean, all parents, I think specifically for their kids, uh, specifically at the board of education in my town, professor, like I'm there, we're actually having the fight. This is just North of New York city. It's happening all over the country. And so I kind of wanted to have you on to talk about some of why this fight is important and how really to conduct and to combat it at every level in every space that we can. So I wanted to just start by talking about the idea of the reaction. And we've seen this throughout history to the black civil rights movement of our time, the black lives matter movement, specifically the summer of 2020. 21? 2020, 2020, 2020, I keep getting that wrong uh, in the aftermath of uh, the death of um, the man whose name I'm escaping. George Floyd, George, George Floyd. Floyd. See how easy we forget. And, and you know, it's like it's, it's also true. Part of it is like you think about so many different victims. Yeah. But but anyway, George Floyd, who's now, you know, memorialized by everybody, but apparently me in an interview with the prestigious professor. What is the how much of this is a backlash, the CRT movement to that movement of our time? It's absolutely connected, but it's it, it, that moment sort of galvanized and animated political conservatives and the right. But the momentum for it had been building. There is never a time, certainly in recent history, where we haven't had pushback to the gains and the progress being made fighting for basic civil rights and human rights for all people, especially African-Americans in this particular context. But what we saw in 2020, in the summer of 2020, in the aftermath of the ki killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Aubrey, and just like you said, it, it's, a, it's an unfortunate list that is very long, yeah. is that you had the largest protest in American history. Like, like in June, 20, 25 million people taken to the streets. March on Washington had 250,000 people for one afternoon, right, for one day. We're talking about 25 million people in June in the middle of a pandemic, 20 million people in July. And one of the things that they were calling for uh, and led by young people was an end to systemic racism. And so that scared the bejesus out of the right, right, especially the far right, because you have those who are in this society line, aligned on that end of the political spectrum, you know, who benefit from the status quo. Right. It works for them. You know, capitalism, corporate capitalism works for them. And the call for an end to systemic racism, the only way that you can actually do something, a response to that, to people saying, look, you got to end systemic racism, is if you actually do something, right? So the challenge then from the right became, well, how can we diffuse that? Because we don't want anything to change, right? Not in a progressive way. And so the way to diffuse that was to undermine what the call was. In other words, saying that we're not going to respond to systemic racism because systemic racism isn't real. Right. That becomes the pitch and appeal. And so that combined with the desire to continue to engage and keep engaged uh, those members of the white community that were most animated by Donald Trump's white supremacy after he loses. Because you can't count on him to use the kind of same white supremacist uh, um, energy. Right. Once he's not no longer in office. So then it's like, oh, what can we do to capture that? That feeds right into uh, this whole divisive concepts and new critical, anti-critical race theory, anti-anti-racism, 
All of that really is that response in the moment to what happens in 2020, uh, in the summer of 2020, and to the loss of Donald Trump or Donald Trump's loss in the fall of 2020. Yeah, you make it more nuanced and and, and it having be several different circumstances. But you also said, I think the first thing you said is it was always there. It just yeah. and maybe it wasn't as refined. Maybe it didn't have the name. But when this this kid. Uh, Rufo and his yeah. his think tank, you know, came up with this idea uh, about they're teaching CRT and the CRT hysteria. And then it got like to the White House in like a day and a half. And then yeah. he puts out an executive order and then boom. I mean, you you've seen this play many times before you said and I wrote this down uh, and I wrote a lot of things down and watching you talk. Racism is the most powerful political organizing tool in American history. And wow, what they did with this CRT thing right down to the Board of Education in almost every certainly white dominated district, uh, including mine, has been very rapid. How do they do it and how do we react? Well, they do it because they've been doing it for a while. I mean, I think the difference and and they've refined it. I think the difference in this moment is they found the catchphrase, right? This this umbrella term, and, and it has nothing to do with actually what critical race theory is. It's everything that they've been opposed to, right? Talking about gender equality, talking about LGBTQ issues, talking about systemic racism, all of that gets wrapped up under this umbrella. And so, you know, they've actually, won- and they're good at it because they have their own sort of media sort of wing that only their people listen to. And so they create this sort of echo chamber and they're very good at uh, manipulating uh, messaging. Uh, and that's what we have. So on the one hand, you have this sort of unity of, of, of messaging, right? We're all opposed to this sort of critical race theory, and we're going to hit it time and time and time and time again. And you have, you know, elected officials who are willing to go along with it. Like, that's the other thing. They're willing to buy into it. Public figures are willing to say, yes, this is actually what's happening in schools when they know it's not happening in schools because they benefit by galvanizing that political base. Oh, do they? They, I mean, that's exactly what happened in in governor and the gubernatorial. I mean, that that guy yeah. came. I'm not going to say he came from nowhere, but he rode the CRT hysteria to the governor's mansion there in Virginia. There can be almost no doubt. I mean, that's see, that's the racism. Right. And, and it, we all, sometimes we think, oh, the racism always has to be a Klan member or something like that or somebody even who is as explicit as Donald Trump is. Right. Yeah. Like, no, it's the subtle stuff. Like, yeah, you know, we really would, you know, whatever our little little white girls, little white sons might be learning in school is problematic, too. It's that subtle that gets that those who don't see themselves as being impacted by racism or or thinking along racist lines that get them on board, too. I want to just ask you in terms of we hear this phrase age appropriate when it comes to teaching about bad things, Holocaust, slavery, sexual assault, rape. Uh, age appropriate, but it's always, I, I think it generally is age appropriate. These things go through all kinds of standards at the state and federal level before they get to the classroom. But you have, oh, you always present this set of data about, uh, uh, bias, internal bias as age, as young as age three. And so talk to me about how the, what the science says about what kids recognize because I think that's why you have to teach or unteach or unlearn that at a young age with age appropriate material and teachings. Give it to me, Professor. Yeah. You know, it's not that people are born racist, right? Why they exhibit sort of racist beliefs or behaviors. It's that everyone you're not born with that particular type of prejudice. You're not born with prejudice at all. It's that you're born into a society in which you breathe the air. That is that is racist itself. And so we know that children as young as three months old are already able to pick up on uh, identify people by race because of the cues and clues that they're picking up from their caregivers. By three years old, they're already internalizing a preference for whiteness. And this isn't just sort of white children, right, who 90 percent or so will will show a preference for whiteness. Yeah. African-American children, more than half of them will show a preference for whiteness by the time they're three and four years old, right? Because they're internalizing the same beliefs and stereotypes, negative about African-American people of color, positive for white folks. There was, then, uh, I, I have a ahead. story that illustrates that of a friend who's a great guy. And I think he's like an anti-racist. I certainly wouldn't say his name, but his parents had their college friends over 
for the night. They, they're out of town. They stayed for the night. Black people. So he, he's white, white parents, black couple stays, comes for dinner, stays over. He says goodnight. He's four or five years old. He says, I don't want them to sleep in my room. And then he's like worried that they're going to get their black on his bed. or yeah. He's like four, maybe four years old. And the reason why he knows that is because his parents use it as an example. Like, how does a four year old, he didn't necessarily learn that maybe from his parents, because clearly they have friends in their home staying overnight. Maybe he did. The point is, he somehow sees that as being a bad thing. I'll never forget him telling me that story. I'm like, you were four. How could you possibly have been thinking that? But I think it illustrates the science that you're saying. And sadly, uh, you know, I had to tell that story, but still. No, and, 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 and that story is so common, right? And it just, it's just a different way of finding expression. And it says to go back to the point that you were making before about, you know, age appropriate, when is too early. Yeah. There's never a time when it's too early. You know, it, it is, you know, before we had this, the, the hysteria around taking vaccines and inoculations, you know, it was a nice point where we all believed that it was actually useful. But like talking about racism is the inoculation to racism, right? Because what the science says we are going to be, we are exposing our children to it. So better to talk about it on your terms as a parent, as a community to say, look, this is what's coming and this is why it's coming. And this is why we don't use this language. And this is why we do use this language is better than just waiting and hoping they're not going to be hit with it because they are. And then, you know, you're in that embarrassing situation where a kid is talking crazy. You're like, oh, my God, how did this happen? Well, you didn't prepare them. Well, if progressives and black folks would stop talking so much about race, we wouldn't have these problems is some, is a call I took a thousand times on the radio live and an argument I've heard. And obviously you've heard uh, longer and, and, and more than me. How do you how do you it, it, we the talk about I talk about it all the time. It's fascinating yeah. and important to me. I learn more and more all the time. But what do you say to someone who says that? Absolutely no problem with talking about race. The problem isn't talking about race. The problem isn't talking about racism. The problem is discriminating against people on the basis of their race. We can talk about it all day and we need to talk about it because race is still socially meaningful, right? Race itself is biologically meaningless. So it'd be nice if we could pretend that we are colorblind because race doesn't mean anything bio biologically, but it's socially meaningful. It structures our society and has done so for 500 years and we use it as a stand in for cultural heritage and cultural ancestry. So to pretend as though we don't see race is actually to erase people and to ignore the lived reality in which we are all. A part right. Of. To, 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 to not see race is to not see you. The answer for a person of color is then you're denying me because it. So when I say I don't have a racist bone in my body or I don't see race, then I'm ignoring you, apparently. Completely ignoring me, because what you're doing is ignoring my lived experience the lived experience of my parents in, in, in the, the Northeast, the lived experience of my grandparents in the Deep South, the lived experience of my great grandparents in slavery, because their lives they, were shaped by the contours of their race and racism in American society. I am who I am because of their experiences. James Baldwin said, we are our history. And that is America writ large, but also us individually. And to separate out the racial aspect, the racial component of my experience denies a critical aspect of who I am. And you cannot see me or understand me unless you see that connection. Uh, one more question on just teaching young people. You had the great honor to be like the, the main script writer at the National Civil Rights Museum in, in, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, the site, of course, the assassination of Dr. King. And, you know, you, so I, I guess you must have, as an, as an educator, a really strong understanding of what museums do, what history inside of an actual building does for young people, whether it's the Holocaust Museum, the National Civil Rights Museum or, or any other museum dedicated to human struggle and social justice. What about the appropriateness of taking, you know, experiencing that museum? Well, that museum, I mean, it is especially unique because it is not just a museum, but it's also an historic site. Right. So this is the place where Dr. King was assassinated. So you have that mix of the power of place, but then also you're at a place that is telling this broader story and putting that historic, horrible, tragic moment into a broader context. And, and we have to take seriously our public spaces and our public museums because, you know, most people learn more 
from the public spaces, from museums, and from public history, including television and documentaries, than they will ever learn in a classroom. Because we do a terrible job in the classroom, as much as we may try. And we also don't have a lot of time, enough time to go into depth and detail. So knowing, for example, at the National Civil Rights Museum, that a, you know, a quarter of a million people to 400,000 people before the pandemic are cycling through that museum every year, and that this can shape how they understand the African-American freedom struggle, that is not only a challenge, but it's a great, it's a wonderful gift. It's, 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 the, it's the opportunity of a lifetime to sort of say, hey, this is, this is a point of entry for understanding this deeper history and to complicate it. So at the end of your museum experience, you shouldn't feel like, okay, now I know it all. You should feel charged to learn more. What if I, at the end of my experience, feel bad and my white daughters feel bad about being white and they feel shame and they, and they feel guilt about their whiteness. What's, what's that about? Shouldn't feel guilt, right? Then we haven't done a good job with the museum. We haven't done a good job with the history because it's not about shame or guilt, but it is about feeling uncomfortable. You should feel, when you look back at American history, you should be like, damn, messed up. Like, I, I do feel bad. Right. right? Like, I, I feel bad, not because I did anything. I feel bad because racism existed. I feel bad because I didn't learn about this. I feel bad because white folk were doing this, right? My ancestors were doing this yeah. to other people. So yeah, you should feel bad about that, but not in that personal way that, oh my God, so now I'm, you know, I can't do anything. I'm frozen. I'm full of tears. No. Look, when we look back at American history, it, it, it's some rough stuff, right? And so we should all be made uncomfortable by it but not in that paralyzing way, because no child certainly is responsible for what happened in the past. They're not even responsible for today. But Pete, and you know this, they're responsible for tomorrow. And it's our job right. to give them the tools necessary so that they can address the problems of tomorrow that we haven't solved today. So yeah, when they, look, this ain't, look, with, the, with the museum down in, uh, in Memphis, there was a time when I was talking to some of the board, you know, board people, there's a nice white board person, and he was like, you know, the old museum, because this was a renovation, to the old museum, I came through at the end, and yeah, it was the King assassination, but, you know, I felt really good, right? And so now, you know, I'm like, oh, my God, the challenges are still here. And I was like, yo, this ain't, this ain't Disney World, right? Like, this is a merit. You want to feel happy, go down to Florida. Like, this is the reality check that this man was killed here. Like, these are the sacrifices. Right. But people have been struggling. They haven't given up. And so what are you going to do going forward? It, it, it always should be a challenge at the end. I actually, uh, I don't want a professor explain to you, but I have a different answer about for my white kid. If they go to school and they come home and feel ashamed about their whiteness, so they experience this museum and they, and they feel ashamed about their whiteness. That's not the school's fault the, the, or the teacher's fault or the curriculum's fault. Certainly not the museum's fault. That's parenting. That's a parenting thing. And you, you might not want to have said that, but that's always been my response to mm -hmm. white folks who are worried about how their kids feel. If they are, then you should be a good enough parent to talk about that and any other I issue yeah. that is that is difficult. And that's your responsibility. That's your personal responsibility, if I do say so. And and I think it's got to start there and we shouldn't blame the history, the books, yeah. the teacher, or the curriculum. Maybe, you know, you can look at, uh, maybe dad doesn't know how to talk about that. <laughs> no, that's a great point. Because there is, as you said, this is for personal responsibility there. The history hasn't changed, right? The history has not changed. How we have talk, talked about it, we've, we've gotten talked about it more honestly, that has changed and it should. Uh, but you're right. There is some conversations that need to be taking place outside of the home to prepare children for understanding the past. What would you say to the whites? My friends in my community and others who care, maybe on the same page with with which much with much of this, and um, they they want this stuff to be taught. And let's say they're even progressive minded, liberal minded folks. Uh, maybe they're anti racist. Maybe they identify that way, but they're not involved at this level, or, or maybe not at all in in any way. Maybe they give a few bucks to, to somebody because the way I see it, I remember where I was when I read whatever it was, letter from a Birmingham jail or, or some quote, I probably saw, you know, like an image, probably wasn't reading a book. I probably saw like an Instagram <laughs> post of, of, a, of a King quote. I really think that's what it was about the white moderate being the issue. Like yeah, every, yeah. everyone had something to say about that. Malcolm X had something to say. Like that's, that's who I was. I was a guy who was, you know, anti-racist and wanted to see change, but, but kind of what was, what was I doing? And other than talking about it, you know, on the radio and stuff, 
But now being involved in the community, I actually feel much different. I feel like more mm. of a part of the solution. But what would you say to the folks who are well-intentioned, but maybe they're not involved because Dr. King and everybody else warned of those people. And I think part yeah. of the problem is they don't get involved is it could be uncomfortable. It's scary to fight racists. No, no, you're absolutely right. So it is scary. Um, sometimes we, one of the problems we do when looking at the past and looking at heroes is that we take somebody like Dr. King and say, oh, he was never scared. He had all this courage. And why can't we all be like him? One, he was scared from day one. And he'll tell you that he, he wanted to get out of it. He was like, I didn't sign up for this. So the, the idea that, you know, why can't we all be like him? One, nobody can be like him, but there is something that we all can do. And that that's, that's the thing, right? It's like, you know, even looking back at the past, right? Everybody wasn't on the front lines, right? The, the March on Washington had 250,000 Americans, right? Out of 250 million. So wasn't everybody there, right? So not everybody is going to be on the front lines fighting, but there is something that everybody can do, right? Within their own small spheres of influence, they can, you know, it, it, sometimes it is taking to the street. Sometimes it is showing up at a school board. Sometimes it is making a donation, but you can't sit on the sidelines. Like, that is the great bit. Like, you can't just say, well, in time, this will change. Like, I need you to do something. You, you, you were right on. And King offers that critique in the letter from Birmingham jail about the white moderate. He's like, you can't sit on the sidelines. You can't just wait for time to pass because time is not a social force capable of creating change. It's just a unit of measurement. You allow time to pass without doing something. The status quo will simply be reinforced. So look, we all have to do something. That doesn't mean that you gotta you, know, you gotta lead the revolution, but you can't sit on the sidelines. You gotta speak truth. You gotta act in some way. That is critically important. You have said, we America, American culture specifically, I think, we hate history, but we love nostalgia. And I think that's a really interesting thing that you you then can unpack. What are you talking about? We love stories about the past that make us feel comfortable in the present, right? That, 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 that doesn't have to be history. It don't have to be true, right? It's just stuff about the past yeah. that makes us feel good about who we are. Yeah. So that means, you know, trying to rationalize evil in the past, the evil of folk owning other folk, right? We'll put a spin on that. Well, they were good masters, for example. That ain't about them. They didn't have a James Madison and Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. They, they were not that conflicted. Right. They didn't free anybody while they were alive or while they were dead. They were OK with it. We're the ones looking back who are like, well, if those are the framers and the founders. What is that saying about us? So we're just going to manufacture in this, this entire history. That's the nostalgia. Nostalgia ain't real. It's just stuff that makes us feel good about the past. And that's what we're worried of. And, and we see our our reluctance to actually deal with history, this idea of hating history, because history is critical not only of the people of the past, but also critical of the people of the present. And that's what we don't want to deal with. And you have said that you're, you're really concerned about the chilling effect that a lot of these movements and legislation uh, that has been passed uh, at the state level uh, in many states uh, is, is going to potentially put a chilling effect or even a silencing effect on teachers. I mean, I'm sure you've heard about, they, they're even talking about bolting cameras into the yeah. classroom so I can watch from home as my daughter's social studies teacher is teaching, you know, the French Revolution, and I'm going to go, hold on there, fella. <laughs> I've got exactly. Google here. In real time, right? Yeah, right, in, right. in real time. I hit a buzzer. I'm like, no, be the teacher. Uh, so and that, yeah. Talk about this, these legis pieces of legislation that are moving through places like Florida and, and your state in Ohio. Right. Yeah. So moving through in Ohio hasn't been passed here in Ohio. But when we see Florida, Texas, Oklahoma. You have bills that have already been passed. So the chilling effect isn't just simply the chilling effect is, is, is taking place in those states uh, in terms of silencing teachers because you're literally saying you cannot talk about this. Right. In Oklahoma, the site of the 1921 Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre by law now would make white students feel uncomfortable. Right. And therefore could not be taught in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Right. Like that's insane. And so now teachers in a place like Ohio, where you have the same language, which goes back to Pete, you mentioned the, the executive order, Trump's executive order. Yeah. All this language is taken ex directly from that. It's just copycat, copycat legislation. And it was given to him by some it was given to him by exactly. some asshole in a think tank. I mean, exactly. just some exactly. dick. This is young all fucking... feeding, all feeding in. Yeah. And so teachers are like, even if the law isn't on the books, 
I don't want some teacher. I don't want some parent coming down, breathing down my neck. I yeah. now got to talk to a right. principal in the school district. and I could lose my job. So it's better that I just don't say anything. Right. That's the chilling effect. And so rather than saying, hey, let's lean into these issues and our discomfort that it may create. And teachers are teachers, too. We know this for a fact. Do not feel prepared to talk about this stuff. That's why the professional development and all this stuff is so critical. Now you're taking that away. So you're telling these teachers who are already uncomfortable with it, just like most of us in America are uncomfortable talking about race and racism and those critical issues. And now you're putting that added pressure on that has that effect where nobody's going to learn anything in the classroom. Yeah, well, uh, I'll let you go, but I get on a, on a, maybe on a good note, it would seem like the solution to this problem is the same solution that the the racist folks, the bigoted folks in America are using, which you mentioned is organizing. And uh, the way to organize has really changed a lot. And you can do it from your own home or shed if you're like me. And I think the answer right now is to organize locally. Do you agree with that? Would you add to that? If you want to fight back, if you want to fight what you're seeing happen in America right now, then what's the answer? No, you're spot on. You nailed it, right? It is, you have to act, you have to organize. And that organizing isn't just focused at what's happening in in Washington, D.C., especially when you're talking about education. Education isn't controlled at the federal level. Education isn't really even controlled at the state level. Education is local. That's the way we've set it up. And so if you want to make sure that your children are learning what they should learn in the classroom and not nostalgia, but actual history, then you have to get involved. The people who have been raising their voices to stop talking about race and racism, they're not the majority, right? They're just a loud, organized, very small minority. And if the majority of parents don't want their children not to be taught honestly about the past, we just got to raise our voices and make sure that that small minority doesn't win the day. Yeah. The Board of Education is where I think the fight is. I think people haven't come to realize that. And it's scary to get involved locally because these are your literal neighbors. And I understand that. But that's that's where it's happening right now. So you're right. You're right. Absolutely right. If, and if I may, if I may say the challenge is real quick, Pete, isn't you know, at what at, there was a moment where I thought that we're really debating policy, right? Like these are policy disagreements. And, you know, whether you're political or conservative, you know, or or conservative or progressive, right? It's just a matter of like, you know, too much tax, not enough tax, this, that, and the other. But we're beyond that at this point. We're at a point where you have a good portion of the country is like, let's protect democracy, right? Now you may disagree about how we do it, but it's like, let's protect democracy. And then a sizable portion of the country is like, no, democracy doesn't deserve to be protected. Democracy is the problem. That's a fundamental difference, right? When you look at democracy and say, you know what, giving more people more say is actually what the problem is. That means that we're no longer dealing with policy. We are at a loggerhead, a fundamental disagreement about the way this, the way this country should operate. Yeah, no, I mean, and I would I would even argue that it, it, it's not that fair. But if we're going to, you know, make the make it more binary or or brief, it's not democracy. It's it's kind of theocracy. I mean, there's no platform. Mm. I mean, one lady in where is it, Georgia, on the side of her bus, she's running for governor or something. Yeah, I saw that. It was like it said, um, babies, guns, Jesus, like that's the platform. That's like the. <laughs> The theocracy, like I don't, you're, they either you either identify with with one or all three of those, and they seem it seems to be pretty, pretty much a catch all. It's it's yeah. kind of where they want to go, and they're even rooting for Putin over Biden, which is insane, and which says to us that sitting down and just trying to convince yeah. those folk, yeah. right, to say, hey, wait a minute, you got to say, like, no, this is at, this is why the organizing is so important, yeah, because this is about power. Right. This isn't about policy anymore. Yep. This is about power and who is going to seize and gain gain the power legitimately, right? Legitimately gain the power, nonviolently gain the power through the existing electoral processes. But it is about power so you can have the power to make the decisions that impact our lives. And I don't mean to be too kind of, uh, I don't know, virtuous or whatever you want to call it. But I mean, like, I just I, I try to talk to my own people, if you will, uh, not to be too tribal, but it's like black folks have done more than their share uh, in terms of getting the Senate. I mean, just look at what that that was black. Maybe even you could say female led in Georgia, the Stacey Abrams and the voting voting matters folks down there and all over the country. But it's like right now, it's like this is this is our time. Like right now, March, the beginning of March, white folks, it's it's time we got to step up and 
And so they're, they're, the time is out. If you don't step up now, you're going to see what's coming. Yeah. It's inevitable. And we all lose. And we all lose. And it's yep. not just going to be black folk, right, who, who, who lose out because of voter suppression laws in Georgia. The democracy loses. Yep. And when the democracy yep. loses, we all lose a portion of that. Man, the stakes I re- are high. Yep. I really appreciated learning from you and talking to you. And I can't I hope that you'll talk to me again at some point because uh, we need more advice and guidance and, and ways to understand this and, and, and get educated about it. And you're you, you know all about all this stuff and you're teaching at the Ohio State University. You like it there, Ohio? You're a New Yorker. It's good, man. It's good. It's good. You say New so. Yorker. I, I, I can afford it. I can afford it. <laughs> yeah, <good> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you got any money left over after suspenders? Thank you very much, there Professor. <laughs> what an honor to talk to you. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Pete. Keep up the great work, man. Well, there you go. Dr. Professor Hassan Kwame Jeffries, first time on the show. What? What did you think? What did you think? Go tweet him at Prof, P-R-O-F, Jeffries, J-E-F-F-R-I-E-S. Go tweet him, please. Let him know that you heard him here. Give him a follow. It'd be amazing if he got like 25, 50 new followers out of listeners here. Go follow him. Make that a point of your day. It'll make mine much brighter to know and certainly get him back here on the show to continue our conversation. All right, that's it. That's all I've got for you on today's show. Christine Romans is set to join me, and I'll probably be talking to someone to recap and react to the State of the Union. Thank you very much for listening today. Happy birthday to John Carroll. Thank you to Pete Coe. And I look forward to talking to you tomorrow. Tell your friends about the show. Spread the word. Give a review. Subscribe at StandUpPete.com. Bye-bye. On your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town, just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down, or you better stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of the stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go to make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up Alright, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up You got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up stand oh, up oh got to stand up oh, come on just stand up